Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, next installment in my series of ongoing conversations uh, with eminent uh, personalities on important issues of the day. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by, by my friend, Judy Shelton. Uh, Judy is a prominent monetary economist uh, in, in the US uh, and uh, she and I were both part of the group that Bob Mandel uh, uh, convened every summer uh, in, in uh, Siena or near Siena uh, in Tuscany to discuss global monetary uh, and trade issues. Um, uh, Judy uh, was an advisor to then candidate Trump in 2016 and in 2017 then President Trump uh, uh, nominated uh, Judy and she became the U.S. Director for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, then in the fall of 2019, uh, President Trump nominated Judy to be a board member of the U.S. Federal Reserve System, that's the U.S. Central Bank. Uh, that nomination, alas, got caught up in, in partisan gridlock uh, in Congress. And then when President Biden came to office in 2021, that was uh, that was then withdrawn. Um, Judy has, as I say, been a strong advocate of sound money over the years uh, and has been critical of uh, some of uh, the recent decisions of the U.S. Federal Reserve, all of which we're going to uh, get into shortly and talk about sort of the history of, of monetary systems uh, going back to Bretton Woods uh, up to our present day. So I think uh, this should be a very, very interesting uh, conversation, and I'm really looking forward to speaking with, uh, with Judy. Judy Shelton, uh, welcome to the conversation. Uh, it's great to have you. I've already uh, done an intro, so the viewers know your many accomplishments. And uh, thank you for taking the time out to speak with me today. It's my great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks again. Uh, so Judy, I was hoping we could sort of, uh, to understand our present situation in sort of global monetary order or disorder, uh, look back I mean, of course, we could look back to ancient times, look back to, to Roman times and the gold standard, but let's look back to Bretton Woods, uh, that institution that came into being or a set of institutions after the, you know, in the rubble of the Second World War, uh, gave us the World Bank and the IMF, but also gave us a global monetary order, which survived, what, about a quarter century. Um, and again, for our viewers who are probably less familiar, a system where the US dollar fixed the price of gold at, at $35 an ounce and other currencies pegged to the US dollar. So sort of a, 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 a modified recreation of the gold standard. And, and, and that gave us a quarter century of, of, of low inflation and high growth. Uh, so if you, if you could tell us, uh, you know, why is it that Bretton Woods worked so well if we agree that, that's, that it did? And ultimately, what was its demise? Why did it, if it was such a good system, why did it ultimately fall apart? Well, I love this topic, and I think it's very valuable to look at prior international monetary systems to get some idea of what was most helpful to uh, increasing growth and uh, reducing inequality, I might say, and um, um, lifting the possibilities for prosperity. Both the classical international gold standard and the Bretton Woods monetary system I think were extremely helpful in terms of bringing about global a global level monetary playing field. And that's really the only proper basis for free trade. And um, I, I think that when you have currencies moving up and down against each other, and especially where governments are in such a position to manipulate currencies, it's very divisive, highly unfair and causes distortions that end up um, bringing about social resentments. Um, in the United States, after Bretton Woods ended, people who were involved in uh, manufacturing cars said, we can compete against the best car builders all around the world, but we can't compete against Japan's central bank. That was the big um, competitive factor in, in that decade. But let me go back to Bretton Woods. It was really a, an initiative by the United States to restore some kind of international monetary order at a moment when the countries under siege, 
in, in Europe were losing hope in the future. Uh, the first memo written um, by Harry Dexter White for Secretary of Treasury Morgenthau was written uh, one week after Pearl Harbor. And the goal was to say, you must try to win. We're gonna work with our allies. We're going to try to beat the Axis forces. And you have to be inspired that it will be for a better future. We're not going back to the 30s. We're not going back to the competitive depreciations of currencies, which caused the, the downward spiral in trade and, and did grave damage to the economies of those countries. They said, we're going to put everyone on a solid platform and we're gonna help you rebuild. And that, that became the, the genesis of not just the Bretton Woods International Monetary Agreement, but also the establishment of the International Monetary Fund to oversee that specific aspect of it, managing a fixed rate system anchored by redeemability in of dollars for gold at a pre-established rate of $35 per ounce of gold. But it also set up the World Bank as a separate entity to help channel capital to rebuild war-torn economies. It also set up the groundwork for the general agreement on tariffs and trade. It was all meant to work together. But I think we're primarily looking at the monetary system. I think that the strength of it was that countries cooperated by maintaining a fixed rate between their currency and the dollar, knowing that there was this, this control valve, the self-regulating mechanism, and that if the US were to inflate, they could take those dollars that went to their shores to buy their goods and redeem them. And countries, countries did periodically redeem them, especially as things started to get out of hand because the US did indulge in fiscal overspending. Now, at first the system was wonderful. And if you look back for the entire 25 years, as you mentioned, it was not just increased growth, but it was increased productivity. I mentioned uh, inequality of wealth. That gap was closing. There was great participation. There were individual benefits. So in fact, under the Obama administration, they wrote up in the federal budget one year, an analysis of what happened during the Bretton Woods era. And they called it the the epic of shared growth. It was one of the best periods in not just US, but global economic history. And, and I have to believe that having that solid foundation of international monetary stability was a huge factor. Now, a lot of people um, would say that the international, the classical gold standard was superior. And I'm in that camp, as a matter of fact because it empowered individuals with the convertibility privilege, whereas the Bretton Woods system only granted the privilege of convertibility to foreign central banks. The other benefit of the classical international gold standard was every country was individually responsible for keeping its money and its fiscal budget approach in sync. They had to be responsible for their own currency because if they inflated and people lost faith in that currency, they could exercise the convertibility privilege. But that became increasingly difficult under Bretton Woods. We know that the French called it the, um, the exorbitant privilege that the United States could inflate and other countries ended up suffering. They became a little bit concerned about redeeming as US put political pressure on countries to discourage them from redeeming dollars and gold as our gold supply started going down. And so I think the ultimate weakness of Bretton Woods was that it was dependent on one country. I, I almost hate to say that the US reneged on its obligation, but that is the case. And when the US closed the gold window, there was really no alternative. I think under the classical international gold standard, if one country was not able to to carry out its obligations in terms of maintaining monetary integrity, it did not destroy the system. It just caused that country to fix its problem. So if I could just ask 
th and thank you for that, you know, sweeping overview uh, of, of, you know, the, of the classical and, and the Bretton Woods gold standard. If I can just ask one follow up, I mean, would you say that that the system ultimately failed because the U.S. in a sense didn't itself play by the rules, or was it because it happened to be Nixon and he had a particular view of it, or or is this sort of what I'm getting at, or is there a structural defect in a system where the U.S. or whichever country is the anchor, as you say, and other and and it's only central banks that can come and try to redeem uh, U.S. dollars into gold. So was there a fundamental structural architectural flaw, or was it that there were just individuals in place who, who, who you know, chose not to live by the rules. And had it been not Nixon and someone else, for example, in the White House, could the gold standard of, or the Bretton Woods system have continued for some time? Well, our, our mutual mentor, Robert Mundell, thought it could have continued for some time. Um, most scholars would at this point bring up the Triffin dilemma and say that that was a structural defect, that the US couldn't keep providing the monetary base in this way without affecting its own um, domestic financial situation. I think it was primarily, though, that we're talking about the guns and butter era. The United States was spending for the Viet Vietnam War. We had adopted these massive social security programs in the Johnson years. and. Um, Nixon was really confronted by Paul Volcker, who grew up in that system, who believed in and supported the Bretton Woods system. Volcker at the time was the undersecretary for monetary affairs at Treasury. And he was one of the people who went with Nixon to Camp David in August of 1971 and said, we need to make an adjustment in the convertibility rate. And he was talking minor, like instead of $35 per ounce of gold, let's just do a, a one-time jump to maybe 37 or 38. And so if you listen to Nixon's speech that night, which Americans, I think, took it as always protecting us from international currency speculators, Nixon's kind of spun it as this, um, a good policy approach to combat people who uh, were trying to undermine United States. Um, Volcker later marveled at that. He said, I thought we would be humiliated when we said we're temporarily suspending the gold convertibility privilege. But those were the words Nixon used. He said, we're going to, this is a temporary measure until we get to an urgently needed new international monetary system, which again, Volcker took to mean at an adjusted rate, kind of as Mundell was saying. And you know, it didn't just happen in August. I mean, there were attempts for the next uh, year and a half to restore it, ending with the Smithsonian Agreement in February of 1973. By that time, they had said, let's get it up to $42 as a convertibility price. And then they gave up because the US was continuing to spend more than it took in. That was inflating our currency. The currency was being used to buy goods overseas because it was still being valued at the old fixed rate. And so Americans were happy to buy out <laughs> goods and services from other countries at the old rate. But those countries were saying, these dollars aren't worth what they used to be. We'll turn them in for the gold. And at that point, it got a little bit ugly with the US even saying, for instance, to Germany, well, maybe you want us to move out NATO troops or discouraging Britain or discouraging France. And um, so it came to an end, but I think largely because the fiscal overspending doomed it and the people who believed in the system weren't able to save it. And um, it's interesting, in the early 90s, I started receiving handwritten letters from Richard Nixon. He liked he liked my book on, on the Soviet Union, and um, he was interested in what was happening in the early 90s as we were about to make the transition under Yeltsin to the Commonwealth of Independent States. And Nixon was fascinated by what would happen in Russia. And in two of those handwritten letters, he says, 
I really don't know much about monetary policy, which always struck me, which always struck me as very comparable to when John Maynard Keynes, who was one of the architects of Bretton Woods, said that it's ideas uh, for good or bad that are dangerous uh, for good or evil. And, and that it's the scribblers influencing people in power who we should be concerned about, that they have the right ideas. I find that interesting because I think that Nixon was relying on the advice he got. And even though Volcker did advise him to end the system temporarily, he later found that other advisors, including under the influence of Milton Friedman, who thought that rates should be floating. Uh, George Shultz also supported Milton Friedman in that idea. And we went to no system, that is in the vacuum, rates floated against each other. Extraordinary. And some of the details you filled in that add a lot of richness to the story, I, I don't think are well known. And certainly what, what Nixon told you, it sounds extraordinary. Um, but you know, as you say, there's that famous passage in Keynes where, where uh, uh, you know, politicians who think that they're impervious to sort of you know, intellectual sway are in fact um, uh, listening to, to some scribbler may, who may be alive or dead, and, and hopefully they had the right ideas. And, and I, just as a, as a footnote, you know, whether anyone likes it or not, or whether we like what he did or not, Nixon remains one of the most consequential presidents in, in modern. U.S. history with the outreach to China, with the closing of the gold window, and, you know, and starting to wind down U.S. presence in, in, in Indochina. So, you know, extraordinarily consequential president. Um, Judy, I wonder if I might turn next sort of to the next. So we've talked about sort of that 45, or rather the quarter century uh, under Bretton Woods. And now what everyone thought, or what, you know, as, as you say, folks like Bob and, 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 and Paul Volcker thought would be a transitory a sort of vacuum, but now we've had a half century or more of a non-system uh, where there is no global monetary system, no, no global monetary order, everyone does their own thing. And the proponents of that system, and I, and I say that there appeared, or the, or the system or the non-system, whatever we call it, and there appear to be many, um, you know, falling back as you see, on, the, on the classic Friedman insulation hypothesis, let each individual national cur currency, you know, buffer shocks, uh, and sort of written into the orthodoxy of all major central banks. Uh, I mean, if you go, for example, you know, here in Canada, if you go to the webpage of the Bank of Canada, it says in black and white, the reason they have flexible exchange rates is to insulate the economy from shocks. Um, and this idea that somehow this non-system of every central bank does its own thing, you know, it used to be monetary targeting, and now it's inflation targeting. Um, and then that system somehow will work harmoniously or that non-system but yet, over the last half century, we, we've seen a capital market instability, financial crises, currency crises. You know, we lived through the Asian-Russian financial crisis, and then the global financial crisis. Um, and then we've we've seen a huge fiscal and monetary profligacy in the major economies, both of the West, you know, the U.S., and Europe, Canada, and global South, as we now call it, uh, giving us the specter of stagflation, not so far in the US, which is you know, still growing robustly, but certainly here in Canada, we're looking at, at the real possibility of a return to 1970s. And we had another bout of that in the, in the 80s of 1970s style stagflation. Uh, so uh, how do we, uh, you know, because, sorry, and, and the other piece of it is that for that long period of time when inflation was low, Everyone, every, you know, all the orthodoxy were saying, oh, you know, we've solved the problem. There's no more business cycle. Inflation is going to be 2% forever. Uh, so, so my feeling is there was a real hubris among central bankers and, you know, and economists, frankly, that we, we'd finally solved the problem. And of course, historically, every time someone says that, something, some new crisis happens that overturns right. the conventional wisdom. So, you know, rather than my sort of sharing my, I mean, what's your view of the last half century of the non-system and, and what does that reveal about the, the faults in our or fault lines in, in our non-system now, Judy? Well, I think you beautifully identify the, the calamities inherent in international monetary and financial relations now and, and covering that, that, that 
huge period, but ones we're still dealing with. Um, Paul Volcker, in fact, since I mentioned him, he said that he, he gave a speech, I believe in 2014. Title was A New Bretton Woods with three question marks. And he said, I think we've come to see that not having a system has not been a good thing and that financial crises are not only more likely to happen, but to impose more damage when they do happen. So he was specifically looking at 2008. Um, a man I have great respect for and, and have become friends with, to, to my great benefit, is Jack de la Rosière of France. And he was a director of the International Monetary Fund. He was the, the head of the Banque de France, greatly respected man um, on these issues. And he gave a speech in Vienna that stuck with me now for a number of years when he said, citing those very aspects that you just did about um, distortions and financial flows and periodic episodes of instability. And um, he, it, and, and especially he has some, some qualms about inflation targeting, whether it makes sense. He thinks a lot of that has led to distorted financial assets and the boom and bust cycle and all of which is very debilitating for productive economic growth. And he said, what we have today is worse than a non-system. It's an anti-system. And he feels very strongly that it would be so helpful to, to bring back a solid platform, a, a foundation of monetary stability on which to base uh, financial assets, um, proper investment, use of, of available capital to put it to its best purpose. I think where I saw, I mean, I'd written a book called Money Meltdown back in 1994. The subtitle was Restoring Order to the Global Currency System. So I've been concerned about it. But you could say, look, things have come along. Yes, there have been a few serious crises, but here we are. Um, I saw a political opening to bring up these issues back in 2016 when um, candidate Trump was making the case for needing to have fair trade not subject to currency manipulation. He was really on a tirade against China in particular. And I think it was easy kind of for the economic elite to dismiss that because then if you get into tariffs, of course, we're all pro-free trade. But China was really doing some hostile things, their trade practices and stealing intellectual property. And I think what what Trump saw was kind of the the what we call flyover country, a blue collar lament that manufacturing was really being hollowed out. I earlier cited the um, the, the car industry, but in lots of areas, um, it was it, business was going overseas, certainly to to Mexico. Now I've taught in Mexico for six years, very friendly to Mexico, and I understand their economic situation. But I certainly, I I watched those videos where you would see the CEO of a manufacturing company in Ohio tell everybody, "This is your last check. We're moving to Mexico." Um, so it's. It's a, I believe in comparative value. I'm an Adam Smith um, acolyte. That's certainly my approach on the benefits of free trade, but I've long considered competitive depreciation not to be competitive. It's not competing, it's cheating. It's simply changing the rules of measuring value to benefit one party at the expense of others. So I'm back to thinking, how do we have this level monetary playing field? Because I don't like tariffs, but I can see that tariffs are used as a direct way to address other types of perceived cheating. So if you want to get away from that, you have to find a way to establish whether a country is inordinately benefiting, that is unfairly, from currency manipulation. So that is... Um, uh, it has to be a political issue or nothing will get done.
but that's where I'm hoping to um, to elevate um, the feelings of citizens. I mean, to what extent can they vote on monetary issues? In a way, not at all. Congress is in charge of monetary policy. That's it's up to Congress to regulate the money. It's um, Article One, Section H, I think, of of the Constitution. And um, I think when the Fed got to 9% inflation, it certainly has caused people to sit up and notice and to say, central banking is not infallible. And even now, as inflation seems to be coming down, much to the astonishment, I think, of the people who serve on the Federal Open Market Committee, it's certainly not working according to the model, which said that we'd see higher unemployment, lower growth. We're not seeing that. Inflation is coming down, I think, largely for fiscal reasons, but I've never thought that low unemployment was inherently inflationary, nor growth inflationary. I don't like growth that's sparked by government overspending, which is a major aspect of why we're having growth now. But nevertheless, I think it has caused the, the problems with having a central bank assert so much control over an economy and, and then keep insisting that they're responsible for price stability. They're quick to say that. Certainly, Chair Powell is quick to say in nearly every speech and press conference, price stability is a responsibility of the Federal Reserve, which in a way is getting the, the members of Congress and the White House off the hook. Here we're running a stimulus, fiscal stimulus program, massive, two trillion overspending at a time with record low unemployment, 5% growth in the last quarter, and we're running a fiscal stimulus program. At the same time, the Fed is endeavoring to maintain restrictive rates I mean, this just makes no sense. What it's doing is starving out the private sector because high borrowing rates impose a real obstacle to private sector expansion. They pays, it, it causes no obstacle for government deficit finance projects because when the treasury borrows to obtain those funds, it pays whatever it has to. It's an auction. So high interest costs, aren't a barrier to growth of government. And that's what worries me. The expansion of government, when you have, when you have the recklessness of fiscal spending juxtaposed against the monetary rectitude of a Fed who's saying we're responsible, so we're going to punish the private sector with high borrowing rates. And in fact, now I think what we're seeing in the United States is manufacturing very much hurt by the Fed's rapid rise in interest rates. Services still in its own kind of inflationary environment with people demanding higher wages. And then economic growth really dominated by government spending. And the largest component of that is to hire more government workers. And I never believe government is in a better position to judge what projects should be pursued, what's viable, and then attach all of their um, requisite requirements to obtain funding as they seek to accomplish other goals, including social goals. It, it didn't work under communism. And I think it's dangerous to think that government is ever smarter than the free market in allocating funding for projects. So I, I think all of the Fed tools should now come into question. What did QE really accomplish? These large scale purchases of assets by our central bank, not what Bernanke thought it would, not at all. What did changing as an emergency, emergency rule, the idea that the Fed would pay interest on reserve balances, what has that accomplished? It's, it's the Fed in the last year will have paid out over 275 billion in interest on cash that is sitting dormant to depository institutions, commercial banks, and then through overnight reverse repos to money market mutual funds. That is money that initially, the whole point of increasing reserves was to encourage banks to make loans 
Now, why should they? They don't have a better deal than to make five and a half percent with no risk, no monitoring, government guaranteed, interest generating. We'll call it an investment, but just keeping the cash there. And I think if Americans understood how much of that 275 billion, which is not counted in our budget as an expenditure, which I also find odd and potentially illegal, certainly it's not appropriated by Congress, but it's real money being spent by a government agency. And about 35% of it is going to the top five banks. You'll never hear a report or ask the Fed, how much did JP Morgan get in the past year? or maybe even more incendiary, probably a third of that total amount went to foreign owned banks. You'll never hear a reporter ask Chair Powell how much of the money the Fed is paying in interest on reserve balances and re reverse repo going to foreign owned banks who park it there with the Fed for precisely that reason. I think it's worth it to put pressure on the Fed to get it to examine these policies. The only one I didn't mention besides QE, paying interest on reserves, is their third tool, forward guidance, which I think has become ludicrous. I mean, we hear Powell at the last press conference becoming shockingly dovish in his comments, alluding to potentially three rate cuts after the Fed has said, we're not going to relent until we have hit our target. Well, now he's saying, as we approach our target, it's an election year, People are already raising eyebrows. And then you have four or five members of the committee coming out to walk it back. It's extremely confusing. The, the dot charts, the Fed is quick to disavow them. Then why do them? Why publish them? So I see all of the Fed's tools in its hollow toolbox not performing as they thought and, and I think being quite detrimental and, and teaching banks not to be not to engage in the noble art of financial intermediation and channel savings into productive investments in the private sector, but rather just engaging with the Fed and is not financing anything. It's in an, And the way you put it, it's an extraordinarily uh, difficult and highly problematic situation. I should add for our viewers that in Canada, we have sort of a micro version of what you've talked about in the US, but it's even worse because we're actually not growing. And uh, we, we've got uh, the, the, the federal government has almost hit a fiscal wall now. So we're really looking at very, very painful, long overdue fiscal retrenchment. Uh, meanwhile, the central bank here is sticking to its guns and it's gonna, if not raise rates, I think they're under intense pressure not to raise, but at least not to cut. So so we're doing even worse. There was a report uh, a few came out a few months ago that most of the job creation in Canada since the pandemic has been in the public sector, not the private sector, exactly what you're saying extraordinarily um, uh, unhappy uh, uh, situation. Um, I will just add as a footnote, if I may, Judy, to what you said about 2016, that I'm struck by the fact that, you know, whatever one may think of President Trump, and I know there are strong views out there, you know, pro and con, that he was, he was, uh, uh, he was more alert than most, you know, first to the danger posed to the global order, by an increasingly bellicose authoritarian China, um, and two currency, so to, or, or to using uh, 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 to bending exchange rates to undermine the principles of free trade, as you it's put it very very well. And I think, and we could spend a long conversation on, you know, I think the time of Adam Smith, it was not a time of fiat currencies, and so I don't think Smith ever worried uh, that I'm aware of of what currency. You know, if, if, if a country devalues its currency deliberately to become more competitive, uh, would that undermine the gains from trade? But clearly, something that academic economists don't talk about enough is a relationship between the monetary part uh, and the sort of the real part. And of course, all of these academic compartments we built where there are the pure trade theorists, and that's all a non-monetary world. It's all relative prices. Then we have the monetary theorists who don't really think about trade. Um, and, and I recall, actually, I think in... I believe it was the second debate with Mrs. Clinton that Mr. Trump in 2016 actually referred to the false economy that the Fed had created. And I believe perhaps he was thinking along lines uh, that, that you were at that at that time. And I, and I know you were advising him, I believe, at that time. So 
Uh, and I'm also struck just as, as a comment really that, uh, it, that interestingly enough, I, I think the Biden administration actually has carried on a lot of the Trump agenda, whether it's on, tr so on trade, I believe it was approximately $300 billion of tariffs, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that were levied at the time of the Trump administration. I believe all but 10 billion of those still remain in place under President Biden. Um, and his industrial policy uh, looks a lot more distorting with you know, <laughs> an emphasis on green and the IRA and the CHIPS Act of trying to simultaneously achieve the kind of ir irreconcilable objectives of greening the economy, bringing jobs home, uh, fix, fixing infrastructure. It, it seems to be a, a strange way to do it. So, uh, and, and now he's, of course, recently rebuilding the construction of the wall. So, so migration is, so it's extraordinary that, that having started in one place, in a sense, whether anyone acknowledges it or, it or not, President Biden ha has essentially said, without saying so, that I agree with a lot of what Mr. Trump did when he was president. So, it's it's a very interesting situation, and and I think fundamentally the problem you identified, Judy, that you know you for decades we had this flyover region where there were there was the hollowing out of industry, and so the politics around trade have become such that I don't think it would be it would be politically possible at this point and when you know where we are now for someone to say, look, I believe in free trade and let the chips fall where they may, uh, because we don't have a, a a level playing field that allows that to, to operate the, the, the way that, that it was intended to, I, I think, but by, by, by people like Adam Smith uh, when he made the case for the for the gains from trade. But but that's just in the nature of our comment. And I, I wonder maybe as, as a last question, Judy, for our for what's been a very rich conversation, is if we take our focus now back to the global non-system, and and you know we You've spoken, I think, I think very, very eloquently about what's what's wrong with it, and particularly in, in, in the in the context of the U.S., how how there's sort of this nexus between the big banks and the Fed and, and Treasury. Um, are there is there any hope that we can return to, let's call it a Bretton Woods 2.0, or some better, some kind of a system? So we get away from the non-system or the anti-system. Uh, is there, I guess I've got two questions. Uh, uh, one, uh, in, a, in a world of ideal policymaking where politicians did what was, was good for everyone, I mean, it would be, that isn't the world we live in, but it, in some ideal world, is there a better system? Uh, what would that look like? And the second part of the question would be, given the fact that it has, that new system would have to be created in a world of politics where every national uh, uh, you know, every every country has its own political economy of within its national uh, uh, politics. Uh, would that better system, if we can think of one, is there any realistic hope it could possibly come into being in, say, in our lifetimes, Judy? I think so. Uh, that's what I'm dedicated toward trying to move forward. But I have to, I have to comment um, since, since you did mention um, uh, Donald Trump. I recall when he was a candidate that he did say, I am for free trade, but he said, but not currency manipulation. He was quite specific. And he also did say, as you quoted, that this is an artificial economy. And that was under Janet Yellen. And he said, how is it under Obama? We've had zero interest rates. Well, when Trump came in, and I think he even considered Janet Yellen, but um, Jerome Powell had presented himself to uh, Steven Mnuchin, the treasury secretary, and he was Republican. So even though he was very much in sync with Janet Yellen, uh, Trump chose him. In 2017, after Trump came in, in January, the Fed raised rates three times. In 2018, when Powell came in to replace Yellen, they raised another four times. And the reason they were raising is they said in those years, those first couple of years under Trump, the unemployment rate had gotten down to this record level, uh, I think 3.6. And people who had been ostracized from, from the job market, minorities, uh, were finding jobs. And, and, and growth was good. 
And that set off alarms at the feds saying, well, now we have to increase rates because this is happening. And then Trump was criticized for jawboning this and saying, this is wrong. You shouldn't be raising rates. You shouldn't. You're undermining it. Look at the stock market. Look what's happening. You're undermining all the good things that we've accomplished by reducing regulations, reducing taxes, stepping up, having a smarter energy policy. And, um, and so he was very critical. Well, I think there was pressure on the Fed and particularly on Jerome Powell, who personally criticized for sure. He slammed him. And Powell initiated a study to say, well, maybe we should look at whether we have to raise rates when unemployment's low and growth is high, just in anticipation of the inflation that would likely follow. Um, and meantime, by the end of 2019, the Fed did reverse three times, three of those increases they took back. Now, somehow Trump got no credit. I mean, in the sense of it was his idea. Well, they ended up saying, you know, I think he was right. I find that ironic because now we have a Fed um, saying that was actually quite loose with Biden. That seemed a bit maybe political, then went up very fast. Now talking about relaxing interest rates when you have the same conditions that caused them under Trump to increase interest rates. And so that, that's why I'm concerned that the Fed will be seen as politicized, rightly or wrongly. It's hard to say why isn't there consistency in evaluating the data and the parameters and proceeding accordingly, even following their own model and what they said they would do. As far as new initiatives, here's something I think it has to be something very, very specific. If Republicans get in or Democrats, it's unlikely that someone's gonna say, we should have an international monetary conference and invite the other countries and agree to cooperate and coordinate and collaborate. And I think everyone would say, why should we do that? We have the world's dominant global reserve currency. And what do we get out of that? Um, I think, we could do a specific, specific initiative. And I, I write about it. I have a book coming out next year. Um, it will describe this approach. But what it amounts to is, I think that our treasury should issue a very long-term bond, even 50-year bond, redeemable in gold. It would be like a TIPS bond, a treasury inflation protected security, in the sense that when people buy TIPS bonds, what they're saying is I'm willing to lend to the US government, but I want some kind of guarantee that if inflation turns out to be higher than anticipated at the time the interest rate was determined on that instrument, I will be compensated. And that's how a TIPS bond works, compensated in accordance with the change in the CPI. A treasury bond redeemable in gold would give the option to the holder at maturity to say, I will either take the face amount in dollars on this instrument or the preordained weight of gold, my choice. You could make that face value equal to 2% increase in the price of gold over the next 50 years. If the Fed and treasury, because it's fiscal as well, live up to 2% inflation target or better, that is lower, then anyone would be only too happy to take the face amount in dollars in 50 years because likely gold would have gone up at the rate of inflation. And that's the premise, but they would have that choice. It would be a way to be a, a barometer, the conscience of US monetary and fiscal responsibility. I would want people to look at what is the rate on this instrument compared to a conventional treasury security or compared to um, uh, the TIPS uh, rate of return. And let that become, I mean, you could say it's just nothing. We have about a half trillion in gold valued at that last $42 price per ounce. When everything bailed out after the Smithsonian agreement, we're still carrying it. Uh, 261 million ounces at $42 an ounce. 
So you can calculate an immediate windfall profit for the United States to put that aside as collateral, which also prevents any future administration from deciding to sell it off, as some countries, I think, did and regret now. Um, and I think it's showing we have faith in the future. Is America still going to be here in 50 years? Are we going to get a handle on our fiscal and monetary situation? Will our condition improve? Can people trust in our currency? And I think it's just a specific idea. Some people might say, well, that won't do much. Well, maybe stable coins could be based on holdings of this instrument. Maybe private firms could duplicate the instrument with conventional treasury securities and gold futures. If people are interested in that sort of a investment, then it will resonate with people and then it will have more influence. But the main thing for me is to set up a beachhead, set up some kind of a indicator of whether the Fed and Treasury are living up to what they promise or are they depreciating the dollar, which I consider expropriation without due process. I think people who are 20% poorer, had they kept all their savings in dollars under their mattress, poorer since January 2020, the Fed may say they're responsible, but the Fed will never make up for the loss that they've incurred. It will never compensate them. We need to change that system and have the money work for ordinary citizens. I think that's the basis of the founding father's approach to, to economic liberty and um, the individual rights. And that's an extraordinarily interesting uh, suggestion. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to your book that will explain that uh, to, to both for me and everyone else interested in, in global and US and, and global monetary policy reform. But, but it's a very fascinating idea that the Fed would uh, would would uh, commit to sort of to a preordained rate today, and in fifty years, the holder would have a choice of either the face value. So it would it would considerably. I mean, if that type of of instrument caught on and it and it became widespread in the market, would would constrain the the Fed and the Treasury, as you say, because they would have to maintain uh, the the value of of the currency and keep keep inflation in check. And I see this as a, a long winded answer, but getting to your, your question, which was, what's the future of international monetary relations? Let's say, let's say China did the same instrument and said, in 50 years, you either get this much in yuan or an ounce of gold. Let's say the European Central Bank, also large gold holders, made the same, the same sovereign promise, issued an instrument very much um, modeled along the lines, the US has to be first on these things. Only the US can make any difference if, if they decide to exercise leadership toward international monetary stability. But this is the beginning of a modern international gold standard in the sense that as you approach the maturity date for, for two, three, a dozen, hopefully major countries who issued the same instrument, those bonds are all, they're interchangeable. They're all worth at maturity, if it were the same date, say, an ounce of gold. It would be, what would a, what would a promise to let you buy gold at say, if I took 2000 and today's price and, and it compounded the value at 2% a year. I think it comes out around 5,400. Would you rather, and maybe you give this as a savings certificate issued by the US Treasury to your grandkids. Would you rather have on the date of maturity $5,400 or one ounce of pure gold? And it's their option. And that could be happening for these other countries as well. And then you see the credibility of the promise. Every country can say, we're going to maintain the stability of our currency. But what are, are they willing to, I guess, literally put their money where their mouth is? And let's do that. And this could become the beginning of a new gold link, not dependent on one country, but every country that chooses to join, that's the entrance requirement. Will you issue such a treasury instrument? 
And um, this could also be a way of when accusations of currency manipulation are, are levied against a trade partner, it's very easy to say, what has been the value of your gold-linked instrument relative to our gold-linked instrument? Because the market should evaluate them strictly on the credibility of the promise and the, and the inherent value of um, the collateral. Indeed, and then there would, of course, the market could say if, if many major con uh, currencies join or central banks join, then all of these instruments become tradable. I mean, in relative thirty days, so you create a market, a global market in the, in this, and strengthen the foundations of of a future global monetary system. Well, this has been an extraordinarily insightful conversation, Jody. Thank you for sharing uh, both your reflections uh, on the past. Uh, it, comments on the present and your aspirations for the future. Uh, it's been an extraordinarily rich conversation. I'm, I'm sure for the audience watching, for my students who will watch this, of course, uh, and for me as well. So thank you so much for coming on to the show. So thank you for your, your generous comments. And I'm sure you know how, how deep a pleasure it is for me to be able to talk with you. And I'm greatly honored that you invited me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.